very intimately connected with the inner life of my childhood was a little forest that had once held a garden and that was now so isolated from the world that it was called by us children St. Helena. A great many snowdrops grew among the hemlock roots and here and there the formal lines of white in the tangled grass pointed out the place where once there had been flower beds. The little ruined summer house was covered with ivy. In the wonderful transition time between winter and spring, if you were lucky, you would find the crimson fairy cups growing amid beautiful, delicate fronds of fern-like moss. It was here that a child came, alone, bewildered and appalled by the sudden thrill of the first touch of the world's mystery. On that January day, she had realised clearly and practically the fact of death, a fact that up till then had been as remote as the blue Galway mountains over the bay, that we only caught a glimpse of it in the very clearest weather. Now, the great, hardly conceived idea had come very close to her. Indeed, it was towering above her head as she stood in the cold wind under the blue and sunny sky, shining above her in floods of transparent colour. She gradually became conscious of a strong, intuitive feeling, a flash of sudden freedom and power, of strange happiness, an uplifting of the soul, a sense of something swift and free, of life in some world beyond the slavery of the senses, some ether beyond the air. All conventional impressions vanished, all half-understood explanations, adapted carefully to the undeveloped child's brain. Somehow, she knew that this was something real, that the event itself was quite close to her, was explaining itself to her in an unmistakable, intimate way. The deeps of consciousness were stirred, spirit moved on the face of the waters. This she did not understand at the time, but she put it into clumsy words that half shocked herself. Now I understand it all. And it's delightful to die and wonderful to think of anyone being dead. She was conscious of a vast comradeship, of unseen hands held out to her, of kindness, of power, of happiness everywhere. And then the glory faded. The intensity of life passed from her. And she began to look for fairy cups and could not find any. And the sky clouded over and she went back to the dark child's world, puzzled and with a heavy heart.
It is a place that on some days can feel like the most open place in the world. And on other days, it can feel like an overarching deceased forest. I often come here when I'm feeling lost and depending on the day or depending on something that I haven't quite figured out yet. I can feel safe and sound inside the walls or feel that all around me are laughing voices, mocking me for things that I do not know. It is a dark place and the walls feel as though they are impenetrable. But on other days, when the window is open and the bird's melodious tune slips in through the gap in the now broken wall, I feel as though there is no difference between the outside and the inside of this place. It all melds into one endless score. I am surrounded by hundreds and thousands of secrets and I am separated from them by an inch of paper and cardboard walls. Some days I feel as though I must digest every wisdom that they contain, but on other days I feel as though I do not deserve to know the secrets that are pressed within. There are very few letters from Eva Gore Booth. I myself have practically none, because from 1896 onwards, we were rarely separated. The letters she wrote to her sister in prison were little gems, short, because they had to be, and full of charm and colour and gaiety, carefully written to cheer one on who was outcast from joy and beauty, bereft of raindrops on green leaves, bright wrecks of fallen showers, and yet not outcast, whilst through your soul a rapture thrills, and there are woods and primroses in the country of your mind. Constance Markovitch treasured those letters until the day that she died. 
but unfortunately afterwards they were accidentally destroyed. Those published were written in the last five years of her life to three friends with whom she had the habit of discussing all the subjects that most interested her. You'll see from a dress that we have landed in a little villa. Most delightful. All the hotels are full. It's a heavenly place, a lovely broad valley full of wild flowers and delightful walks near Damodossola. To come up in a sort of breakneck motor bus. It's lovely to be right out of England. It's so far from the Tottenham Court Road and heavenly to sit in a wood and write for most of the time. What you call my book of thoughts is growing very fat and bulky. There is a great satisfaction in trying to express the perceptive foundations of your thoughts, as well as the thoughts themselves, those vibrations of life that one is especially sensitive to, and that account for one's own particular private way of thinking. I expect that everybody builds up their universe on much the same lines, on some special individual sensitiveness. Do you understand the Einstein theory? I don't, but I am interested in it. Because it seems to me they're on the verge of finding out that we can know nothing really by material means. Because every material thing we know of, including ourselves, is in a violent whirlpool of motion at different rates of velocity. And what a thing is when it is still, or even if it can exist in that state, what scientist knows? The Buddhist Wheel of Life was a good description of that time and space which even the scientists are beginning to realize as different aspects of the same thing. The only things we can really know are the same yesterday, today, and forever. And are somehow outside the psychic and physical vortex. I'm sending you the first of what I hope will be a series of articles in the Herald of the Star. My plan is to take one by one the fundamental religious instincts, such as the sense of something wrong, sacrifice, etc., and trace and analyze these instincts in the different religions, showing how they work out in the religions of power and in the religions of wisdom, on the basis that in every so-called religion, there are these two cults, And the true division is not Christianity, Buddhism, Mohammedanism, but those who follow the path of love and prayer in each, and those who put their faith in organization and goodness in churches. I expect that the next one will be even more interesting, as I plan to trace and analyze the universal religious instincts that come out everywhere. I didn't choose the subject of my essay, but was asked to write something about comparative religions, but it's a very fascinating subject. Do tell me what you are doing, or much more interesting, thinking. Hampstead, October 1923. What a lovely, long, interesting letter. I'm so pleased you're interested in my book, and especially grateful for what you say of the part about the divinity of Christ. Kingston Hill, April 1924. I've just found a letter which I should have posted long ago, thanking you for the Blackwood, which I read and returned to the library as directed. I was much interested in it. It seemed so poetic, 
and symbolic of how one wants to live mentally. Hampstead, November 1924. How good of you to write. It was a great cheer to get your letter, however blighted in tone, as I was feeling also rather blighted. The laryngitis was very painful, as usual, but I'm much better now. Clusters, 1925. Your letter struck a very responsive chord in me. It is so true how one spends one's time getting lost and returning onto one's rest. Hampstead, 20th of June, 1925. So glad to get your letter. I do hope you are better. I'm afraid it's a long, weary business. I am simply wonderful now that the dreadful pain has gone and I'm feeling intensely happy and luxurious. Everything in life seems so happy and beautiful and right. I can't express the feeling of peace and joy and utter satisfaction and the overwhelming love and beauty and peace of God that has been given to a wretched pig like me. Hampstead, October 1925. We are just back from Switzerland and I am wondering how you are and how the world is going with you. I was ill most of the time abroad, but have suddenly got better and I'm rejoicing in returning life and energy. She had been lying in the garden all afternoon, feeling very ill but not complaining at all, and planning to go away to see an invalid friend for a few days. We left her alone a short while and she suddenly appeared in the sitting room where an Italian friend was singing. He turned around upon seeing her and said, Eva looks as though she's been in paradise. E piena di gioia a un'aria mistica. Afterwards, she explained to me that she had been feeling very wretched that afternoon. You know, I have always been afraid of death. And I could not get away from the fear of it. Then, she went on, quite suddenly, as the answer to prayer so often comes, I heard, I will come to you. Slowly and clearly, like that. I was almost stunned by the suddenness. And in my amazement and wonder, I, I could hardly believe it for a moment. Then I heard, I have promised, remember, very distinctly. She felt certain that this was the voice of Christ. It was absolutely remarkable. There was a radiance all around and and I was filled with an extraordinary feeling of joy. The greatest I've ever known. Remember, she repeated twice, very empathetically to me. I will never be afraid of death again. Death came very suddenly, after two days of illness, on the 30th of June, 1926. She was feeling terrible, that last evening, suffering terribly. And suddenly she said to me, This is death. Yes, it is, I replied. But you told me you would never be afraid of it again. Oh no, she replied. I am not afraid. Pray that it comes quickly. At the end, she smiled, that exquisite smile that lighted up her face whenever she saw one that she loved. She closed her eyes and was at peace. The storm has cleared the air. The sea holds the sun and the blue sky. Suddenly, everywhere, 
shining. All things are one. Is it like this when you die?